This video introduces proofs in SL. It introduces the basic structure of proofs, as well as the first couple of rules of the system. Recall that a proof is a series of sentences. Each line is either an assumption or is justified from previous lines based on a rule of proof. Schematically, a proof will look like this. Every line has a number, and there's a vertical line next to the numbers. The premises are listed first, and we put a horizontal line underneath them to separate them from the other sentences. Every sentence after that horizontal line has to be justified by some rule. All the rules of proof that we're going to discuss are summarized on the last two pages of the textbook. This provides a valuable reference. When we're working out a proof, you'll want to check the structure of the rules. So I encourage you to look at that reference table um, as you're working through proofs. Let's start with this ridiculously simple argument. P, therefore P. The simplest rule of proof in our proof system is called reiteration. Here's the listing for it. Schematically, you have a sentence somewhere on a line of your proof. The reiteration rule lets you write down that sentence again on some later new line. The schematic rule has m rather than a line number because it can be any line. m is the number of whatever line your sentence is on. The schematic rule has a script letter a because it can be any sentence. It can be a sentence letter or it can be a long compound sentence with lots of connectives. What you write as the rule is the abbreviation for reiteration, that's just R, followed by the number of the line that you're repeating. So here's our simple little argument from earlier. P is a premise on line one. On line two, we reiterate line one and write down the rule, R, referring to line one. The reiteration rule is almost stupidly simple, but we'll have use for it later. It's the first basic rule of our proof system. In addition, we'll have two rules for each connective. For each connective, we'll have an introduction rule, which lets you write down a sentence with that connective, and we'll have an elimination rule, which lets you draw out a conclusion from a sentence with that connective. We'll abbreviate introduction as capital I and elimination as capital E. So the two AND rules will be written ampersand I for AND introduction and ampersand E for AND elimination. What should our AND introduction rule be? To put the question differently, what could you know that would let you draw the conclusion E and F? What could you have earlier in the proof, or as premises, or as something else that you'd proven, which would let you draw the conclusion E and F. Well, if you knew E and you knew F, then you'd be entitled to conclude E and F. That's what our AND introduction rule will let us do. Here's the schematic version of the rule. You have two sentences somewhere in the proof. You can write down the conjunction of those two sentences. Here, it refers to lines M and N. In an actual proof, those will be numbers, but they don't have to be right next to each other. There are any two lines earlier in the proof. If E and F were premises, we could apply the AND introduction rule in this way. The rule lets us write down E and F, and we write down AND introduction, 1, 2, as our justification. In a longer or more complicated proof, the lines might not be right next to each other. So imagine a longer proof where the dots here are just other lines filled that are filled in. So we've got E on line 5, and we've gotten it from somewhere. Who knows what rule we use to get E on line 5? And we have F back on line 2. We get around to line 8, and we want E and F. So we write it down, and our justification is and introduction 5, 2. Provided we have the two conjuncts available somewhere earlier in the proof, we can put them together to make the conjunction 
anytime we want. What should our and elimination rule be? To put the question differently, suppose you know G and H. What conclusion does that allow you to draw? Well, given G and H, we can conclude G. Alternately, we can conclude H. Either one follows from G and H. So our AND elimination rule has two schematic versions. Given a conjunction, a sentence where AND is the main logical operator, you're allowed to write down either conjunct. Consider this argument. Parenthesis M and N, close parenthesis. AND, parenthesis O and P, close parenthesis. Therefore, M and P. We set up the proof by writing the premise on line 1. The horizontal line underneath it means that everything after that needs to be justified by a rule. I've written want M and P by the premise. That's not formally part of the proof, but it's a note to ourselves about how the proof needs to end. Once we can write down M and P, we're done. We only have three rules so far. So you might just be able to guess which one we'll use. But it's helpful to think about proof strategy even at this stage. Our premise is a conjunction, an AND sentence. So we should think about possibly using AND elimination. That lets us write down either conjunct. We can write down M and N, which is one of the two conjuncts, by AND elimination on one. But on line two, we now have another conjunction, M and N. We can apply AND elimination again, this time applied to line two, to write down M. There's nothing much we can do with line three on its own. Notice, though, that we can still get something out of line one. The AND elimination rule lets us write down the right-hand side as well. We can get O and P by and elimination on 1. Again, that gives us a new conjunction, and we can do something with that. We can get P by and elimination on 4. Notice that we now have M on its own line, back on line 3, and we have P on its own line, on line 5. That means we can write down M and P by and introduction, applied to lines 3 and 5. That's the conclusion of our argument. So we're done. This is a proof that proves the argument that we set out with. We'll find ourselves wanting to make the claim that particular arguments can be proven. For example, we've shown that it's possible to give a proof of this argument. Logicians have a symbol for this. The symbol is called a turnstile because it looks a bit like a subway turnstile. It means that a proof is possible. With what's given on the left as premises, you can prove what's on the right. Here's a mnemonic to help remember what the symbol means. The turnstile is the same shape as the lines that structure the proof. And the turnstile means that a proof is possible. There are 11 basic rules of proof. Reiteration plus an introduction and an elimination rule for each connective. We've introduced three of them so far. We'll get more in the next video.